From the campus studios of Saarland University, this is Ropecast, a lighthearted podcast for learners of English, with Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Welcome, Ropecast listeners, to another Ropecast on the subject of English gardens. So today again, I have as my guest in the studio, Peter, one of our experts on gardens, who's taken many Germans and a few other people to visit English gardens, and he's going to tell us again today what uh, what is attractive about them. <laughs> Welcome back, Peter. Well, good morning. I think we could start with something that is rather negative, though. Last time you mentioned the man who's known as Capability Brown, Lancelot Brown, who remodeled whole landscapes for wealthy landowners. And I think as part of that, sometimes there was a, a village in the way, as it were. Well, and if it was, it had to be removed. Complete with all the inhabitants. Well, the inhabitants, some of them may have survived because his intention was to create room for, well, water, for lakes, which looked like rivers. And this was the important thing about, one of the important things about his idea of what a landscape had to look like. Water was required, bridges were required, and although it was just a lake, the impression the visitor had was that it was a flowing, a moving river. Right. So this idea of, um, I think there's a quote, an appearance of beautiful nature, it's very much an appearance. It's not the reality, is it? Uh, in fact, normally people would assume that uh, gardeners took painting, paintings as a starting point for creating their own gardens, well, with Capability Brown, the opposite is true. He made his gardens to look like paintings. I think one of the most attractive places people can visit is um, Stour Head. It is. It's uh, a good example is. of this. There is a lake in the middle. And it is the idea, well, it is per perfect in terms of Capability Brown's approach to well, the landscape garden, and it is not just the water that is omnipresent there, it is the path leading around the water, and there are all kinds of buildings, grotto, and, uh, well, what uh, people will utterly miss there is flowers again. I think it's also important to, to emphasize that there are no longer these straight vistas from a central house. It's really a kind of more or less a circular walk, isn't it? Well, exactly. I mean, the idea of uh, vistas had been done away with by William Kent, yeah. and Lancelot Brown did exactly the same thing. And then you have these things that are meant to look like um, Roman or Greek temples, all kinds of strange buildings. Well, and later on, absolutely strange buildings were, were added, uh, follies, the folies, as the French call them, absolutely purposeless structures meant to embellish gardens. Right. So it's something for the eye to look at, something it to is. catch eye the ca eye. Eye catchers, yes, exactly. that's it. Yeah. Instead of vistas, you have got such things. Yeah. If we move on into the 19th century, um, one of the great influences then was the fact that the British Empire was expanding rapidly and people were exploring other parts of the world and, among other things, bringing back plants. Exactly, and uh, plant hunters had have been with us since the 17th century already. I mean, the tra Tradescents, for example, oh, yes. who, who basically started this tradition, and further on it became a very popular thing for royalty, but also for nobility to, well, to uh, make use of something like, which I would call upmanship, uh, having the rarer plants and more extraordinary plants in their own gardens. And of course, there's this wonderful collection at Kew Gardens, just, uh, just on the edge of London. Well, this is something that is a very important aspect. Royal, I mean, in France, we were speaking last time about uh, the French court, Louis XIV and so on, Versailles. Well, English kings, um, they also, or British kings, whatever you may call them, they also wanted to uh, be to be owners of beautiful gardens, and Kew Gardens is a garden that we basically owe to George II. Yes. Uh, the other thing, I think, in the 19th century is new technology. 
So as in Q, so in some smaller gardens, we now get greenhouses or glass houses. Well, those glass houses, we should really mention a man who disappeared too early, Prince Albert. Oh, yes. And uh, when he organized the first uh, great exhibition in 1851, well, the main attraction really was in Hyde Park, Crystal Palace. And when you hear the word Crystal Palace, people cannot imagine. Normally, they don't imagine how huge it was. And it was, among other things, meant to be a place where rare exotic plants could be seen for the first time. Yes. Because hundreds of thousands of people visited it. The other thing about um, the Victorians, they, they used their technology to heat these glass houses so that uh, all kinds of really quite exotic plants could, exactly. could survive. And, and there were kinds of mini glass houses, if you if you accept this term. For example, there's something like a, a beautiful garden, the, the Lost Gardens of Heligan. In Cornwall. Uh, in Cornwall, where you even today can see, uh, well, what amazing amount of work was done in order to, uh, well, to have room for pineapples. So they planted and uh, harvested their own pineapples there. <laughs> yes. um, when we get into the Victorian period, you mentioned Prince Albert, the Victorian pe uh, period is um, really rather backward looking when it comes to gardens in England. Well, to a certain extent it is, because, because formality was reintroduced and um, well, an important moment in as far as the English garden is concerned was when William and Mary became king and queen of England. When they arrived from Holland, they introduced a kind of combination of informality, English type, and formality, French type. And this can be seen at Hampton Court Palace. Ah, yes. Again, just on the edge of London. Well, I think we will take a break now, Peter. <laughs> there is, we still haven't quite reached our own period, so we'll come back to that another time. But thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. And goodbye, listeners. You've been listening to Ropecast, brought to you by Saarland University, featuring Roger Charlton and Peter Tischer. Tune in for the next edifying episode on your podcast dial. Thank you.